Hi everybody, welcome back to another installment of Remote Sensing in Pajamas. Today we're going to cover change detection, another one of the most common applications for remote sensing technologies. Um, and typically you'll see this applied um, when looking at broad classification. But you can also see change detection applied to continuous variables, um, particularly with biophysical monitoring. Um, you might see uh, examinations of trends in either vegetation growth or canopy water content or sea ice extent. So you know what, maybe it'd be more interesting if we just look at a couple examples of, of how um, really diverse the application of change detection is. One common application for change detection is land cover change and it really does pro provide some interesting perspective on not just urbanization but also how land use or different vegetation types um, or habitat types are changing including looking for fragmentation. It's pretty typical to see uh, change detection studies presented in this way where they'll just lay together the different land cover maps for each of the time periods they're interested in. Um, this happens to be a suburb of Las Vegas um, and looking at the expanding uh, impervious surface classification on these land cover maps. Um, but really what change detection is about is not just putting different classifications side by side but actually being able to identify the differences and quantify them in one composite image. For example, here are two um, images from Montana in 2000, a very severe wildfire season out west. Um, and again, you'll see this classic uh, juxtaposition of the two different images. But again, what's really of interest is being to able to identify where that change has occurred so that we can pull that into ARC and start making um, assumptions about how much area has changed or the particular type of change that's occurred. Deforestation is another uh, common example. We can look at different images to see the actual uh, harvests or we can go in and just do a change detection algorithm and actually see the areas that have been deforested and be able to quantify those. And then what's really interesting is you can use that information on the rates of change to predict into the future how that change might continue into the future if sort of business as usual practices continue. In its simplest form, change detection just takes two different dates, uh, before and after, and quantifies the difference between those two. So here's an example of Arctic sea ice extent, and I don't know if you notice up in the right-hand corner here, this is the melt that occurred just in three days um, compared to the typical extent for the sea ice. So uh, that could just be an anomalous year. It becomes much more interesting when you look at a time series. So for example here you can see that there's a lot of variability from day to day and month to month and year to year in Arctic sea ice extent. But if you are mapping your uh, sea ice extent on a regular basis and then plotting that out over time so the satellite record runs from about 1980 uh, to the present day, you can start to see trends and this is the amount of uh, ice that melts every year. Some change detection assessments rely on those multi-temporal images and phenology is a perfect example of that. Here we have assessments of the start of spring and to even figure out when spring begins using remote sensing technologies you have to have multi-temporal, many, many different image dates that are in close succession and you need to be able to fit a curve looking at some vegetation index. Here they've used a couple of different indices, GCC, EVI, and NDVI, um, and then also a combined MODIS phenology product. So they're looking at four different ways of assessing when spring starts. In other words, when it goes from being primarily brown into having um, a very high vegetation index that would indicate that uh, leaves have emerged from their buds. And so they do that over 
each spring season. So again, you need multi-temporal imagery just for a given year to identify when spring starts. But then you also, also need to repeat that in multiple years. And this is looking at the change in the start of spring uh, between 2000 and 2014. And you can see that anything that's in green means that it's coming earlier. So spring will be starting earlier. And then anything in blue would indicate that spring is starting later. I'm not seeing a whole lot of blues here in any of these different approaches they use to try to quantify that start of spring. And in fact, if you if you map out a histogram of all of those pixels and how early they are, you can see that on average we're about a half day earlier for temperate forests across the eastern United States. So this would be a more complicated example of change detection um, where you have to treat your variables as a continuous response. But for this class, since this is an introductory class, we're going to focus really on um, just that sort of before and after change detection and how uh, classifications change over time. Before you can even start on this more uh, simplistic approach to change detection, there are some minimum requirements. Obviously, you have to have two images, right? One from that represents some before status and some that represents some after status. And they have to cover the same geographic area and be co-registered um, really to within a half a pixel. Because if your registration between those two different image dates is poor, you're going to be picking up differences that may have nothing to do with the actual change over time, but instead are just because your registration is off. So that registration becomes really important for change detection applications. Um, you also have to be able to quantify whatever it is you're looking for. If you're trying to look at deforestation, you have to make sure that you have a fairly ap accurate map of forest, non-forest uh, surface features. If you're trying to map changes because of wildfire, you have to make sure that you can actually quantify burned areas. If you're looking at uh, changes in, um, in you know, developed areas, impervious surfaces, you have to make sure that you have a good map of those. So, so the quality of the map becomes much more important when you're doing change detection, again, because you're trying to minimize error that is not truly because of the change in the surface feature, but it's instead is just because of error in the initial classification or identification of whatever it is you're looking for. And so you can typically, it's, it's done on classified images, so you'd be looking at how uh, different classes are changing from period one to period two. But particularly when you are trying to look at um, you know, biophysical modeling or changes in an index like NDVI, you have to make sure that those two images are matched as closely as possible in the pre-processing. And that includes making sure your atmospheric correction is accurate so that you are comparing apples to apples in those two images and that any changes you identify aren't just because of different, uh, you know, solar illumination angles, um, or different atmospheric conditions. And you'll also often see a histogram equalization done. So in other words, you may have conducted an atmospheric correction but find that it's useful to go in there and actually make sure the brightness for each band is adjusted with a histogram equalization. Again, so that you're minimizing any differences that might be be there just because of different seasons um, or different time of day when the images were acquired. So those are the minimum requirements, but ideally, again, to get an accurate assessment of change, you would like to see these two images also have the same spatial and spectral resolution. So when you start comparing before and after images from different sensors where they don't match up in their pixel size or in what spectra are used um, in the classification or in the algorithm development or the vegetation calculation, you're going to, again, be introducing potential differences that have nothing to do with change. Um, you also have to make sure that you have a high enough spatial resolution to really be able to detect whatever it is you're looking for. So if you're looking for, um, you know, for example, an increase in impervious surfaces or increases in development or fragmentation, but you have a, you know, 250 meter modus image that you're using, are you really going to be able to pick up new housing lots that are put in there? Or are you only going to detect um, huge developments in apartment complexes? And if that's the case, are you okay with that? So, so making sure that you have a spatial resolution that matches your goal is also important. Um, and then just other ways to minimize those 
differences are really just trying to make sure that we're pulling images from the same sensor, from the same season, from the same time of day with the same um, solar illumination angle and the same look angle geometry. So this is particularly important if you're using sensors that have that point capability. So you wouldn't necessarily want to be using one before image that had the satellite pointing off to the east and looking at that area of interest from the east and then on its next pass for your after image having it be looking at that same area from the west because there will be tremendous differences in illumination just because of that view angle. So if we had to sum it all up, really, you have to be very careful when you're collecting your before and after images and processing those that you're minimizing any differences in those images that are not due to actual change in the surface features on the ground and what it is that you're trying to quantify. So let's go over a couple of the different ways you can run a change detection algorithm or visualize change uh, using the remote sensing software packages that we have available to us. And we'll start simple and then we'll look at some of the more complex options. Really the easiest thing that you can do is called an image overlay and essentially all that you're doing is you're taking your two different image dates and in this case you actually could have up to three image dates and you apply the exact same band from each of those images to a different color gun right so essentially uh, you would be seeing the same band but for the red uh, color gun you would assign that to your first image date and the green color gun you would assign to your second image date and then if you had a third image date you could apply that to the blue color gun. Now you have to be very careful how you interpret these differences in colors dependent upon um, the timing of the imagery. Typically we expect that disturbance um, or some kind of a change in vegetation is going to result in pixels going from a darker value to a lighter value in those lower wavelengths, for example, in the red, the green, or blue. If you're in the NIR, however, you might expect that vegetation that was very bright in the NIR, if that vegetation was removed, it would suddenly become darker. So you have to know what you're looking for, which band you're using, and how the change that you're looking for would manifest in that band. So if I, for example, were looking for deforestation and I was using that NIR band 4 then that would mean that I would be looking for pixels that were bright in that NIR band in the first image and were not bright in the second image right? and if the the first image was applied to that red color gun and the second image was applied to the green color gun then I would expect those pixels would look red in my image overlay because they were brighter in the first image image date which was assigned to the red gun. Right? So anything that was red that would tell me that it had been bright and no longer was. So that would be an area of change for me. So that just is an example of how there's no hard and fast rules that if you, you know, here I, mean, I know it says if you see the color of the year you're assigning it to that that means there's been change in that year. Um, but that really isn't always the case. You have to interpret it. And so let's practice that with this example here. So here we have um, some imagery from 1994 and we are comparing that to 1996. And actually it's quite interesting. Notice we do have two different sensors here, but we have tried to match up which wavelength we're using. So we have 700 nanometers to 900 nanometers there and 760 to 900 nanometers there. That's the closest we could get. Same spatial resolution. And we're looking to see where there's been change. So we've applied this 1996 image down here to the red color gun. So you got to pay attention to the order here. Okay, so if this 96 is red and the 94 is applied to our green color gun, that means that anything that was brighter in the 1996 image is going to show up as red because it was assigned to the red gun and anything that was brighter in the 1994 image is going to show up as green because that was assigned to the green gun and then if there's no difference it's just going to show up um, as black as a no no data value very dark pixels so when, what does that mean in terms of interpreting what's happened so if we know that we have red showing up 
when we have brighter pixels down in here, right, in this 1996 image. That's indicative of vegetation change in this particular band, right? So we're not quite out in the NIR plateau. And here, vegetation is a little bit darker than our impervious surfaces. So wherever we go from having darker to suddenly having lighter pixels, it's now going to show up as red because these brighter pixels have been assigned to the red band. So everything in red in this image or areas that have been cleared of vegetation. And everything that you see in green is the opposite. That's where this earlier image was actually brighter. So these green areas would be areas of revegetation. So for example, notice the circle inside uh, this little roundabout to get on the highway here, and we can see that that is showing that it's revegetated. So again, be very careful about how you interpret with this image overlay. Pay attention to what band um, you're using, how you would expect that band to change based on whatever uh, you know land cover change you're expecting to see and which color guns you have those applied to. So the image overlay really is just a visual analysis and involves um, quite a bit of your interpretation expertise in figuring out what's happened. Um, but we can do some other automated change detection algorithms. And one is called image differencing. It's pretty simple. You're still picking one particular band that you think is going to be able to detect whatever change it is that you're looking for. And you use a very simple band math to subtract the values of one of those image dates from the value of the other image date. And essentially what you're left with is the change in that particular band between the two time periods. And again, you're assuming that if there has been change that you would see um, you know a, a specific increase or decrease in that band that you're looking at. Now you can do this on just straight raw band values or you can do it on vegetation indices which is much more common. Typically you'll see two um, vegetation indices calculated for each image date and then you subtract uh, based on that vegetation index instead of on the raw values. So as an example here, um, we have NDVI calculated for 98 and then again in 99 and just by doing a simple difference method, anything that's decreased, so if it was brighter because NDVI was higher in 98 and it was lower here, you would end up with a positive value and we've color coded it so that positive values show up in red because that indicates a loss of vegetation and then anything that changes in the opposite direction where NDVI actually increases that is coded as blue so that would in indicate revegetation. Keep in mind this really is just simple band math. It's taking one value and subtracting the other. So when you do this approach, the first, the very first step in calculating that difference, you're not going to end up with an image that looks like this. You actually end up with a grayscale image because it's just calculating another continuous value. It's going to have a one band output and that could take, uh, you know, values depending on how much it's changed from some negative value to some maximum positive value. But then what we have to do is figure out what is a real change. What difference in that math actually constitutes a real change on the ground? Because we know that there are slight differences in registration. We know there are slight differences in maybe atmospheric conditions or solar illumination. So it's unlikely that we would have the exact same, I mean, the exact same NDVI value between these two images, right? There's just all sorts of little uh, it, sources of noise that might be altering that NDVI calculation. So we have to also look at our data and figure out what we think represents a meaningful change. And typically, that involves looking at the histogram of your output image difference image. Right? So really, you know that if it's a zero, then of course that indicates there was no change. But really, there's noise in there, so we have to have some buffer about zero that we say, okay, this may have changed, but not enough to truly be called a change in either the positive direction or in the negative direction. So typically you're going to examine this histogram. People will often use uh, standard deviations. These sigma stand for standard deviations um, about that range of, of change values you've calculated. And so you are going to get a different result depending on what you choose as your threshold. And sometimes this is an iterative process where you go in 
and you might say, okay, well, let's say anything that's above two standard deviations of an increase, we'll call that revegetation. And anything that's below two standard deviations as a decrease, we'll call that loss of vegetation. And you would color code your output image appropriately to represent that, where everything that's no change would be either no color or some gray color. And then you would color all of your image difference values above two standard deviations of the mean, your blue, and everything below two standard deviations of the mean, you're red. But then you'd really want to go in and verify that. And if those thresholds don't seem appropriate, because you clearly with your eye can see that there's change it's not picking up, then you would go in and adjust that until you're comfortable with the changes that it's picking up. Let's look at another example of this. Um, this is some work that one of my past graduate students did looking at land use change in the Mekong River Delta in his homeland of Thailand and really trying to understand how agriculture is encroaching upon um, the forests in that region. And so we have a 1988 image and we have a 2008 image. And if we were just looking at this with our eyeballs or using an image overlay, it might be hard to interpret because there are just so many changes over these 20 years in this area. And so what he did, one of the ways he was looking at change, was by comparing um, band 4. So again, this is that near-infrared band. We would expect it to be very bright for vegetation and darker for non-vegetation. And so he took 2008 and subtracted 1988. So if you're taking... Um, a bright value in 2008 and you're subtracting a darker value, you're left with a positive value, right? Higher minus a small lower number would be a positive result. So those show up as bright areas. And as an example, you can look at this sandbar in here, right? And so the sandbar was not as large in 1988. It's actually silted in. Um, and so we're seeing that come up as brighter in 2008. So anything that was brighter in that near infrared band, uh, band 4, is showing up as brighter in our image difference. On the other hand, anything that shows up as darker, right, that means that it was actually brighter um, in the NIR band in 1988. And so, for example, what we see showing up here, these very dark spots, are these new rice paddies that have popped up. We now have water with very high absorption. And so we're seeing that change popping up as a very dark feature. So everything that's in uh, a bright color in the image difference shows up as basically a revegetation. Anything that shows up as a very dark color is a loss of vegetation uh, for that area. So this is the grayscale that you would expect from image differencing. But then using the thresholds, you can identify those areas again that have lost vegetation versus gained vegetation. And now you can pull this out into uh, an ArcGIS platform to quantify how much of the total land area has increased versus decreased in its vegetation. Um, and the threshold that he used was a 20%. So if it had increased more than 20%, then he was showing it as green. And if it had decreased more than 20%, it was red. And everything else was just shown as no change. So that's the image differencing method, really a very simple concept. Another more complex approach um, actually gets starts off with an unsupervised classification. Now the way that ISO data algorithm works is it starts grouping out your pixels into clusters of like spectral values. Right? But it actually does it so that similar clusters or ordered sequentially. So hopefully you noticed when you were going through your classification and assigning um, classes to your unsupervised classification output that the, if there were groups that were representing the same surface feature, they were typically right next to each other. Right? So that unsupervised classification, usually if the classes are closer together, you know, it's ordered class 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, etc. If they're closer together, they're usually more spectrally similar. So this discriminant function al analysis starts with the unsupervised classification, and then it compares your two images and gives you a probability that you had a significant change from one class to another class in your two unsupervised classifications. And so it's actually trying to say, well, how spectrally distinct 
were these two different classes that that pixel was assigned to. And obviously if they were the same class um, in both unsupervised images, it would be called a, a zero. A probability of zero means there was no probability that it changed because it didn't change. right? And if you get a value closer to one, this is telling you that it's highly likely that you did have a significant change in the land surface classification for that pixel. So a little more complex in, in terms of the math that it's doing, um, but also interesting in the output that it gives you because it's really trying to give you a probability-based output instead of just a value of change. Using Apisan's same example here in Thailand, you can see that we start with the exact same 1988 and 2008 image, and we get another grayscale output for our discriminant function algorithm. But now anything that's bright is just telling us that there's a very high probability that it has changed classes based on the unsupervised classification of both of these image dates. And anything that's very dark is likely to have not changed at all during those two between those two image dates. So this does not tell you the nature of the change, right? You don't know if you're seeing something that's becoming more vegetated or less vegetated than it was in the past, but you are at least isolating areas that are highly likely to have changed between those two image dates. So you have to think, um, there, there are a couple of caveats to this, right? First of all, you have to make sure that when you're running your unsupervised classification that your settings are exactly the same. Right, so if you ask for um, 15 output classes, you need to make sure you have 15 output classes for both of these. You need to make sure you're using the same um, type of imagery, that you're using the same spatial resolution, that um, you know you have the same spectral resolution, because we want these classes to line up if the surface feature is the same. And so really that should be the first step. You have to verify that in your in both of your unsupervised classifications that you use as input to this discriminant function, that if a class is called a 5 in this image versus this image, they're both really the same thing. Okay. Then the second caveat is that sometimes this is useful if you only expect to see one type of change. You know, an example would be in the Amazon where there's just the huge jungle and you're really just looking for deforestation. You don't expect in this huge contiguous forest that there would be any reforestation. And so in that case, you could just use the discriminant function alone um, to identify areas of change. But you can also see how this might be useful as an additional step, or maybe even a first step in your change detection. If you go through and you run this discriminant function analysis, and you highlight those areas that are very likely to have changed, you could then limit the rest of your analysis by building a mask. Right? You could basically mask so that everything that wasn't likely to have changed is not now included in your output and in a sense what it would do is help you refine other methods like that image differencing method if I came through and had masked first so that only areas that were highly likely to have changed and then use this image differencing to just show me which ones had changed in a positive direction and which one had changed in a negative direction then perhaps the threshold that I choose isn't as important right because I'm already sort of ignoring any pixels that aren't likely to have changed very much so don't think that any one of these approaches sort of has to be a standard alone, they can be used in conjunction with each other. Now, the nice thing about all of those um, detection algorithms that we just went over is that they're very simple um, and they just really require you to sit and spend some time interpreting them. But they don't always get at exactly how surface features are changing. They're really just for identifying change and maybe the nature of a change. The most useful approach for actually finding out how surface features are changing is by actually comparing two different classifications. So we call this a post-classification comparison. right? So you would have gone through your two different image dates and gone through all of the iterations of unsupervised classification, maybe some supervised classification, so you have a hybrid approach. You would have checked your accuracy for both of those, so you, you really would have gone through that whole process until you had two different classifications that you were happy with. And then what you can do is you can compare 
those two classifications and actually count up how many pixels have changed from one surface type to another surface type. And you can then um, color code that so that you can see, well, which one of these things were forest and changed to impervious, or which of these were ag and have changed to grassland. Um, so you can see that the complication with this is that depending on how many classes you have in each of your classifications, you could have a whole lot of different classes of change type because you could assume that any pixel theoretically could, go, could change to any other pixel value, any other class value. So to make this work, you really do have to have your two different um, signature files that you've saved from your classifications so that for each of these different image dates, you know what it was in that image date and then you know what it became in that image date. And you manually would go through and you would color code how things have changed specifically. So and so this is where it's really helpful to remember exactly what it is you're looking for because, you know, if the change that you are mostly interested in is, you know, from urban fringe to urban core, then you would want to make sure you color code that so that it stands out appropriately. And here, for example, we're not seeing the full matrix of options here because there are lots of other things. You know, each of these different vegetations could go back to urban core. So imagine that all of these can flip in the opposite direction as well. So it can be um, a little bit of a nightmare, but if you were looking for something very specific, that's where it becomes easier because you can just color code those things and let everything else just sort of be some neutral color. Now, the benefit to this approach is that you can actually construct a, a matrix to identify exactly how pixels have changed within your study area. So you would do a count of how many images that were class one we're still class one in the second image date and the count of pixels for your study area could go right in that matrix. However, anything that was a class one and changed to a class two, you could include a count of those pixels as well and so on and so forth. And so what this does is it really gives you an idea of how much of each type of change you've seen and how much of your study area remains stable. So this really is much more informative, um, particularly for natural resource professionals and for planners, because it's not just enough that we know something has changed, it's really helpful to know exactly how it's changed. Now while this post-classification comparison approach can be much more informative, we have to keep in mind that it also can be very dangerous because one thing we don't always think about is that errors within our images are compounded when we use, use images together. And so what I mean by that is if, for example, you had an 80% classification accuracy for both of your image dates, right? that means there's a 20% chance that a pixel has been classified wrong. And it could be randomly anywhere within that image, right? Um, and if both of those have 20% chance of being wrong, when you pull the two of them together, it means that now you've compounded that error and you have about a 40% chance that there's an error in your change computation, right? So this, this is something that we don't often keep in mind. We're going to produce some nice pretty picture with these change detection algorithms, but when we're using classifications where we know there's already error inherent in those classifications, we have to remember that we're compounding our error. So this is not always the ideal approach, particularly if you're not 100% comfortable with the accuracy in the classifications that you're using. So luckily, you know, there are scientists out there who said, you know, this is a real problem. Is there some way we can get around that and we can still use um, two different image dates but without having that compounded error from a classification that we do first? And so they came up with the idea of what we call a multi-temporal classification. So what they do, what they decided to do, was to take all of the bands from their first image and all of the bands from their second image and stack them together so that they now become one image file essentially with twice as many layers in that, right? And so then they run a classification, but they run the classification on those two different image dates combined. So if there are pixels that have changed between the two image dates, they're going to be classified differently as the pixels from the pixels that were the same in both of those image dates because their spectral characteristics over time in those different stacked layers will be different. 
I mean, it's really quite ingenious. I love this thinking outside the box. So back to Apisam's example, we're back in Thailand. We have his 1988 image, his 2008 image, and he simply stacked both of these images together. So now they're in one big file, a file that's twice as big with twice as many bands. And he then ran a principal components analysis on that. Now remember, a principal components analysis allows us to reduce the number of bands that we have in our image so that, for example, running an unsupervised classification wouldn't take so long. Right? And it gives us a smaller number of bands, but it's been specifically designed to pick up the most spectral variability in our data. And it sees change, right, where the pixel values have changed from one image date to the other, or as it sees it, from one band in that image to another band in that image. It really pulls that out within that principal components analysis. And you can see how these areas of change have really been marked out as separate classes within this PCA. So then what he did is he ran the classification on the fully stacked PCA. And what you see is something that comes out much clearer where you're actually classifying the change itself. So in other words, you're not classifying the surface type in the first time period and the surface type in the second time period. You're actually classifying for each of those different change types. So with this approach, we only have one classification, so we're not compounding that error. And we still know how things have changed, right? As it's classifying those changes, we can go in, and when we're um, classifying the different clusters through our signature analysis, right, we can actually identify, oh, I see this one was vegetation, but now it's a rice paddy. And so we know how the nature of the change has progressed between those two different images. But that's part of the disadvantage. Because it's actually classifying change, it can be much harder for you um, to go back in and figure out what each of those different change classes can be. And that can also make it somewhat difficult to interpret. But you know, still, it's better than uh, you know, take extra time to interpret something and figure out what different classes of change are than it is to just know we have a ton of inherent error in the product that we're producing. So hopefully what you've gotten from this little video here is that there really is no one right way to do a change detection analysis and it really does depend on your goals and what you're trying to either visualize or quantify, right? So here was just looking at the image overlay and applying different bands um, to different color guns from each of the image dates. And then we actually looked at the vegetation indices looking at image differences for where we're revegetated versus losing vegetation. We can look at the discriminant function analysis which used that unsupervised classification first to identify areas that were most likely to have changed. Right? And then we were able to use that to classify which regions had changed. And then we looked at that multi-temporal classification where we stacked our image dates first into one image and then went through and ran a classification on that. So we were essentially classifying the change itself and not the surface features that it started with. Um, so really, you get to pick which of these you think works the best for your purposes and there are pros and cons to to each of these um, and in fact what's most interesting is that you might actually want to do a combination of these approaches. Maybe you start with an image overlay just to identify the biggest changes in your image and what those are. Um, and then maybe you'll do a really simple uh, image difference on a vegetation index or whatever it is you're looking for. Maybe you have some other index that captures what you're looking for. But then you can maybe run the discriminant function to filter out the areas that you think haven't changed. Or you could use the discriminant function to filter out areas over here that haven't changed in your post-classification, multi-temporal classification. And what's nice about that is maybe that would give you fewer signature classes that you actually have to interpret and figure out what they are and how they're changing. So again, you could think outside the box and really come up with your own approach to performing change detection. So hopefully this has been a good introduction to the basic concepts and some of your options for uh, running a change detection algorithm. We'll be practicing some of this in lab this week. So hopefully as we really work through these with 
a hands-on test of some of these different techniques, you'll start to get a feel for what each of them is actually doing. So happy quizzing, and until next week.